Welcome, uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, it's our last uh, lecture for uh, this day and this evening, um, and um, I'm thrilled to have with us uh, for the third Polotsky Distinguished uh, Lecture, uh, Professor Tonio Sebastian Richter, who is a Professor of Coptology uh, in the Freie Universität Berlin and the head of the uh, long term project database and dictionary <coughs> uh, of Greek loan words in Coptic and also of the new uh, project of the Vertebu. Uh, Polotsky Distinguished Lecture tradition was initiated uh, by us uh, three years ago. Uh, the first lecturer was Professor Kammerzell from Berlin, from the Humboldt Universität. And the uh, second lecturer last year was uh, Jean Minon from, uh, uh, Professor Jean Minon from Liège. Uh, I I'm so happy that uh, Professor Richter is here for this lecture. It's a great honor for us. And it would have been especially important for, for Polotsky because he's really one of the most eminent coptologists in the world today. So we are all waiting <laughs> for... Thank you, your organizers, for this granting us this most productive day. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for uh, loading a burden on my shoulders, which is uh, almost unbearable. And well, to uh, encourage myself, I start with a preface. On the empty throne. The eminence of Polotsky's personality is still now tangible in the impact that his mere presence left on people's minds and memories. Many of those who knew him are still telling stories about it was when they meet him the first time. I do not belong to the blessed ones and why not this is sadly etched on my mind. I remember the fateful day when I missed to meet Hans Jakob Polatsky. On this day in 1990, the year when I started studying Egyptology at the University of Leipzig, a graduate student told me he would attend a seminar taught by Polatsky at the Free University at Berlin, and he encouraged me to join him. At that time, Middle Egyptian language teaching at Leipzig was based on the textbooks of Eber, uh, Erhard Gräfe and Wolfgang Schenkel, two openly Polatskian scholars. Therefore, though hardly knowing anything about Egyptian, I did already know of Polotsky's enormous impact on its study. This uneven mixture, mixture this uh, one drop of knowledge, in an ocean of ignorance was my problem. I felt simply too unlearned. I decided not to let my unworthiness bother this giant of Egyptian linguistics. Less than one year later, Polotsky passed away, and I painfully realized the finality of my missed chance to make his acquaintance, at least in terms of the sensuous world, like to see his, uh, his appearance, to observe his gestures, to hear his voice, to smell or breathe the aura emanating from him. At that time I had started learning Coptic, first on the basis of Walter Tilt's Zahedic grammar. Only later I discovered Polotsky's groundbreaking words works, Etude de Syntax Copt, the Coptic Conjugation System, Nominalsatz und Cleft Sentence im Koptischen, 
die Grundlagen des koptischen Satzbaus, his reviews of Till's grammars, which became a model of interesting, well-written reviews for me. And I experienced, like many readers of Polotsky before, sudden enlightenment of my intellectual twilight, emergence of new unimagined horizons of what can be known about Coptic and how we get to this knowledge and what a challenge nevertheless, or even more, Coptic still remains. I will never remember this fateful day in 1990 without a slight increase of my regret, great as it already is. Just over a year ago, I changed to the Egyptological Seminar of the Free University. In the seminar's inventory, there is a piece of furniture, a plain, inconspicuous chair. It survived two relocations of the seminar during the last two decades because a peer's tradition knows that this was Polotsky's seat when he was teaching during the winter term 1990. My encounter with the empty throne was like a déjà vu, touched by a waft of the same tremendum that kept me from approaching Polotsky still alive a quarter century ago. I never dared to sit down on this chair, although everybody did. Only in the last week I brought myself to do so, and this was simply a necessity to cast out old demon of fear and to arm myself with a boldness to climb this le lectern today and to speak to a most eminent audience under the most eminent name of Hans Jakob Polotsky. Whatever in the Coptic language is not Greek can wholly be considered ancient Egyptian. This claim could seem a bit too obvious to be interesting. In 1812, however, when Johann Severin Vater wrote it down in the multi-volume linguistic encyclopedia Mitridates, this statement was still far from a commonplace. It was a learned guess at best. For it it was still 10 years until Jean-François Champollion would lay the foundation for any reasonable judgment on the ancient Egyptian language by the decipherment of hieroglyphics. Up to then, the identification of hieroglyphic Egyptian as an ancestor of the Coptic language was merely a hypothesis, mainly based on the comparison of Egyptian words sporadically quoted by Greek, Latin, and biblical authors with suspected cognate roots found in the Coptic lexicon, such as Erpis, Coptic Erb, wine, Kakeis, Coptic Kake, bread, Mo, Coptic Mo, water, Chemia, Coptic Kemi, Egypt. By the time around 1800, Coptic was a fairly well understood language. While Champollion originally cracked the code on the basis of Greek, Greek proper names of Ptolemies transcribed in hieroglyphs, the genealogical relationship between Coptic and the hieroglyphic language quickly became a certainty to him and a key, a major key to his increasing understanding of Egyptian. And this was mentioned before today somewhere. Throughout the foundation phase of Egyptian linguistics, the knowledge of Coptic served as the most efficient tool to assign lexical meanings to hieroglyphic words. This is to establish an ancient Egyptian lexicon. And still 50 years after Champollion, the knowledge of ancient Egyptian was, to a large extent, a knowledge of lexical items rather than any morphosyntactic items. 
lexical rather than morphosyntactic items is what I'm going to talk about today. I'll take my starting point at two long established attitudes in the lexicography of the Egyptian Coptic language. The synchronic approach to the lexicographical description of Egyptian taken by Egyptologists over the last century, my second point, and the disregard of the mass massive influx of loaned vocabulary resulting from the language contact of Egyptians with Greeks and Arabs in the later and terminal phase of the Egyptian language by almost all Coptic lexicographers. My third point, after a side remark on the study of language change, notably in the lexicon, point four, I will make a plea for an integrated lexicography of the Egyptian Coptic language by introducing two recent attempts to approach such an aim, points five and six, before I come to my conclusion, point seven. Egyptian lexicography in the wake of the Berlin School of Egyptology. Hans-Jakob Polotsky's Egyptological Nursery, a so-called Berlin School of Egyptology, has changed the overall view on the Egyptian language tremendously. The year 1889 when Adolf Ehrmann discovered the pseudo-participle, the so-called pseudo-participle, and his academy uh, 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 paper Die Sprache des Papyrus Westka, eine Vorarbeit zur Grammatik der älteren ägyptischen Sprache, appeared. The year 1899 has been apostrophized by Polotsky as Annus Mirabilis, of Egyptian linguistics. Roughly speaking, there were three major achievements resulting from Adolf Ehrmann's original breakthrough discoveries. First, the genealogical relation of Egyptian to the Semitic phylum already inferred on the basis of its pronominal morphology and numerals by previous scholars such as Theodore Benfey, 1844. The genealog genealogical relation of Egyptian to the Semitic phylum was now ultimately substantiated at several levels of the language, including nominal and verbal morphology. Second, second, earlier scholars looking at the Egyptian language without appreciating and without being able even to appreciate its root and pattern morphology, had recognized nothing but plainest mechanisms of agglomerating words into most primitive sentences. The Egyptian, wrote William Dwight Whitney in 1867, was a language of the utmost simplicity or even poverty of grammatical structure. Its roots, which are prevailingly monosyllabic, are also its words, neither noun nor verb nor any other part of speech has a characteristic form or can be traced back to a simpler radical element. <coughs> Ehrmann was the first one to accredit a real grammar to the Egyptian language. The third big achievement of the Berlin School and the one that concerns us here was the discovery of different phases of the Egyptian language of its diachronic diversity. Until then, Egyptian seemed not only to lack any appreciable grammar, it also seemed to have kept almost unchanged over thousands of years from the erection of the pyramids up to the rise of Christianity, as scholars liked to put it. And both features, its plainness 
and its stability seemed to be mutually dependent. To quote Whitney once again, who wrote, the differences are comparatively slight between the old Egyptian and the later Coptic, for the exceedingly simple structure of the language has saved it from the active operation of linguistic change. The rationale behind his argument rests upon the contemporary view that linguistic change is basically a decline of languages from complexity to simplicity. The concept of the unchangeability of Egyptian Coptic granted, on the other hand, a valuable working hypothesis to early Egyptologists. If Egyptian Coptic could be treated as really one unit, early Egyptologists could gain the greatest possible profit from the understanding, for the understanding of ancient Egyptian from their knowledge of Coptic. Egyptian grammars and dictionaries in the wake of Erman's discovery have reasonably been dealing separately with single synchronic language phases or subcorpora <laughs> along the lines of, uh, of, uh, of, of Erman's scheme, which looks uh, more or less like the one that we would, uh, uh, how we would frame it. Erman himself started in 1880 with his Neuegyptische Grammatik and also the monumental lexicographical enterprise of the Berlin School, the Altägyptisches Wörterbuch, has a synchronically limited scope to words from hieroglyphic and hieratic Egyptian texts, skipping demotic and only randomly coding Coptic cognates. <coughs> I come to my third point, loan vocabulary in the lexicographical record of Coptic. The massive loaned vocabulary borrowed from Greek has always been striking Coptic scholars. The aforementioned Johann Severin Vater wrote in 1812, from the time of Psamaticus, Greeks, and without doubt also their language, exerted influence on Egypt. This influence apparently grew strong under the Ptolemies, whose court was talking in Greek, and who established the headquarters of Greek erudition at Alexandria. A big amount of Greek words and grassisms necessarily entered the ancient Egyptian language, and this is how Coptic presents itself to us in its well-known shape. It is crowded with Greek words." End quote. And he concluded, as we already heard, whatever in the Coptic language is not Greek can wholly be considered ancient Egyptian. Oddly enough, it was the ancient Egyptian component of Coptic alone, which would captivate the lexicographer's attention. As I said before, the knowledge of Coptic had gained crucial importance for the foundation of ancient Egyptian philology in the decades after Champollion. It appears as if this interesting novel perspective of on Coptic was momentous for the further development of Coptic lexicography. In its peculiar result, all newer dictionaries of Coptic are restricted to its non-Greek vocabulary. They are as it were, inverted etymological dictionaries of ancient Egyptian. To gorge the consequence of such a lexicographical selection, one may imagine a hypothetical a dictionary of English, which would only include words of Germanic etymology, or a dictionary of Ivrit restrict, restricted to its Semitic cognates, 
to the strict exclusion of all else. It was a maverick in the fields of comparative linguistics of the day, the prolific and provocative writer Karl Abel, who first pointed to the benefits of a compilation of Greek words in Coptic. Abel wrote in 1876, it would be an enormous task illuminating the interrelations between the two national and language spirits on multiple levels, as he framed it in terms of 19th century Völkerpsychologie, to compile a lexicon of these Greco-Coptic words, to reckon their instances, uh, the instances of their occurrence, and to discuss their relationship to their purely Coptic synonyms in terms of both frequency and meaning." End quote. 140 years from now, Karl Abel proposed a project that looks noticeably close to the one which I will be talking about later. Especially Abel's interest in token frequen frequency to reckon the instances of their occurrence, as he said, strikes me as an, at his time, rather unusual, if not impossible, approach, unfeasible approach. On the other hand, Abel shared a presumption of Coptic linguists of his day, the opinion that Greek words in Coptic, notwithstanding their huge amount, were generally not adding but just duplicating semantic information already lexicalized by Coptic native synonyms. <coughs> it was not before the 20th century when the massive presence of Greek roots in Coptic texts began <laughs> to interest scholars who started investigating loan roots for several purposes, such as the study of morphophonetic traits of Greek roots in Coptic for the philological benefit of their identification or the study of semantic properties of Greek words in Coptic, since occasional differences between the usage of Greek words in Greek as defined by Greek lexicography and their usage as loan words in Coptic had now become to be realized. Also, the information provided by Greek loan words in Coptic for the study of post Hellenistic Koine and the alteration of Greek in late antiquity was now appreciated. And in 1934, Louis Théophile Fort apostrophized the Coptic loan vocabulary as the most important auxiliary source for the study of Greek, of the Greek lexicon. Only in the 1950s, however, attempts to a systematic lexicography of Coptic loan roots were made. The story of the first and most vigorous one, which time does not permit me to recount here at great length, is attached to the name of Alexander Bölisch, Polotsky's not so highly esteemed co-editor of Manichaean manuscripts at Berlin. By the mid-20th century, Bölisch at that time director of the Institute for the Christian Orient at Halle in former Eastern Germany, which is of some important importance for the story, started compiling a comprehensive card index of Greek loanwords in Coptic. Bülich's work documented a number of progress reports, a few festivals of corpus-wise glossaries, and some 40 boxes containing about six, 65,000 lexicographical slips came, however, to an abru abrupt end in 1963. In this year, after a conference abroad, Bölisch went back not to Eastern Germany, but to Western Germany, where he would hold the chair for Christian Orient at the University of Tübingen, taking the loss of his card index at Halle into account. 
attempts to push ahead with Bulik's project were taken immediately after Bulik's flight by one of his doctoral students and later in the 1990s by one of his successors, but they did not get to any visible result. In the 1970s and 80s, Bulik himself took a new, slightly altered approach to his old project. Abandoning, abandoning the goal of completeness, he strived for more modest targets. Under his auspices, uh, index of Greek words in the Nakamadi codices was produced, and a certain Gertrude Bauer published a concordance of uninflected Greek words in the Bohiric New Testament. As we know now, this publication was just the tip of an iceberg, a collection of 15,000 attestations throughout the entire Coptic corpus, uh, collecting and uh, semantically and syntactically describing Greek particles, conjunctions, prepositions, and uh, adverbs in, in Coptic, which is a valuable uh, source, and I, come, I will come back to this later. An even more ambitious, eventually too ambitious, lexicographical approach to the Coptic lexicon was initiated in the 1960s by Rodolphe Casser at Geneva. His Dictionnaire Auxiliaire Etymologique et Complet de la Langue Copte aimed at a comprehensive lexicography of the entire Coptic corpus without regard to source languages, thus including indigenous Egyptian words, together with words borrowed from Greek, as well as from Arabic. His Dictionnaire uh, Auxiliaire uh, uh, did not proceed beyond uh, a first festival, running from, from Alpha to, to Beta Alpha. Parts of its groundwork were later incorporated in Werner Witzichel's Coptic Etymological Dictionary of 1983. In the meantime, we got used to content ourselves with substitutes such as indices and concordances of Coptic subcorpora, although providing just a reduced range of lexicographical information, such tools helped us coping with the lack of a proper lexico uh, loanword, le loanword lexicography. My fourth point is uh, a short remark on the diachronic change of the Egyptian Coptic language and on language change in the lexicon. <coughs> the Egyptian Coptic language, attested over more than 4,000 years from the earliest, earliest development of the hieroglyphic script before 3000 BCE, up to its obsolescence and extinction, at least as a spoken language, by around 1300 CE, can justly be called, and has been called today a couple of times, the most long-lived language so far available to linguistic study. Due to its unique longevity, it provides, and also this was mentioned before today, evidence for all domains and kinds of language change up to extensive processes, cycles, and trends. Therefore, its language is apparently a most worthwhile object for historical linguistics, notably for the typology of linguistic change. Among all subsystems of linguistic science, the lexicon is outstanding by its sheer number of elements in comparison to the universally much more limited number of meaningful elements in phonology, morphology, or syntactic pattern formation. It has been argued that there is less resistance to change in semantics, in the semantics, than in other areas of the length of grammar, of the grammar so that meaning changes occur relatively quickly and easily. But it is not just an issue of resistance. The 
this proportionately bigger quantity of elements in itself is likely to multiply events of linguistic change in the lexicon, such as the emergence and disappearance of words or meaning changes as compared to sound shifts or changes of grammatical forms or and structures. McMahon, 1994, has pointed out that changes in meaning and in, lexical in the lexical inventory tend to have higher profile among native speakers than other types of changes. Most native speakers will thus be aware of semantic changes which have taken place within their lifetime. And I've no doubt that everybody here in this room shares this experience. Cultural pessimists take this awareness as an indicator for the decline of language. This is to say of civilization. Historical linguists would instead try to operationalize it as a parameter of the mode and speed of language change processes in the lexicon. In the 1950s, under the confident name of glottochronology, which was uh, evoked today uh, before in this room, under the confident name of glottochronology, retention and replacement rates of single lexemes and parts of the lexicon within a fixed period of time were calculated and conceptualized as parameters for the dating of language diversification processes. Morris Suarez's concept of core vocabulary and his list of basic term, terms were crucial for these endeavors. One of the advocates of this method, Robert Lees, wanted to calibrate the glottochronological measuring stick, as it were, by testing a sample of 13 pairs of parent and child languages. And we have heard about this approach before today. A sample of 13, 13 pairs of parent and child language such, languages such as Old and Modern English, Latin and Tuscan Italian, Old Nordic and Swedish. On the basis of Swadesh's 200 items list, Lees calculated an average retention rate of about 81% per millennium, which he considered a universal invariable. Saying, I quote, we take this to mean that on the average about 81% of the basic root morphemes of a language will survive as cognates after thousand years for all languages at all times. Nobody today would want to stipulate this generalization. But what is interesting at least outcome is that the pair of Middle Kingdom Egyptian and Coptic exhibits the lowest retention rate of all languages of his sample, ranking even behind such languages as English and Romanian, which underwent heavy relaxification. To estimate the evidence of this result, remarkably quite the opposite result of what 19th century <laughs> linguists and Egyptologists had expected. To estimate it, we would certainly need to know some details about the underlying data. In the case of Egyptian, they were provided by Egyptologist Klaus Baer of Chicago, where Lees was working before he moved to Tel Aviv University. In any case, it is heavily questioned, if not devaluated by all the problems which have been brought against Swadesh's concept of basic vocabulary. In the case of corpus languages without having access to competent speakers, even the plain operation of identifying words, lexicalizing meanings of basic vocabularies is far from obvious or trivial. Did Klaus Baer, uh, when he compiled his 200 items list for Coptic, 
just stick with the existing Coptic dictionaries? Is thus his compilation restricted to non-Greek vocabulary, or did he take Greek loanwords somehow into account? This is in any case what Ethan Grossman and Stefan Polis recently did. Their still unpublished study, Diachronic Lexical Semantics in Ancient Egyptian Coptic, the e Egyptian Ness of Basic Vocabulary in Coptic, is based on a much refined concept of basic vocabulary as provided by Martin Haspelmatz and Uri Tatmos Leipzig Jakarta list. And they did also take a Greek lemma list into account. But imagine what outcome would we see were we able to extend the question of retention and replacement over the entirety of the Egyptian Coptic vocabulary, thus to many thousand instead of 200 lexical types, and to the full spectrum of lexical Methuselahs, middle-aged words, and ephem uh, ephemeral items. And how many shades of gray would we recognize? Could we systematically check token frequency and therefore appreciate the processual character of the rise and decline of innovative and conservative, conservative lexical choices? These are issues that lead me to my last points, the introduction of two recent approaches to an integrated diachronic lexicon of the Egyptian Coptic language. Point five, diachronic lexicography of Egyptians, a project structure and transformation in the vocabulary of the ancient Egyptian language. The first project I want to introduce to you is a long-term project of the Berlin and Saxonian academies. As its full name, structure and transformation in the vocabulary of the Egyptian language, text, texts and knowledge in the culture of ancient Egypt, as its full name indicates, it addresses questions about the Egyptian Coptic vocabulary, such as how was the Egyptian lexicon structured synchronically at a given time, according to parameters such as different periods of time, geographical regions, types of text, linguistic registers, semantic fields, etc. How did the Egyptian lexicon change diachronically, driven by what language and culture intern or ex internal or external motives? And what does this tell us about how the Egyptians themselves conceived and classified their world and how these concepts changed through the four millennia, millennia accessible to us by textual evidence? Two core tools their construction, elaboration, and refinement are in the focus of this project's daily work. The, the electronic full text corpus Thesaurus Lingua Egyptiae, TLA, and a diachronically integrated word list, the vocabularium Totius Lingua Egyptiae, VTLA. The first appliance, the TLA, has been conceptualized and built up from the early 90s in a forerunner project at the Berlin Academy. It always amaze, amazes me how, how early these uh, people at that time uh, um, anticipated what is nowadays called digital humanities and how long this project uh, 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 was uh, standing on the board when the wave of digital humanities started to, uh, to roll. In any case, the TLA is 
for the recent, for the present project, a uh, property inherited by a uh, forerunner project and as any heritage, it grants us the comfort of using it and at the same time puts it under obligation to foster and increase it. The first development of the Thesaurus Linguae Aegyptiae has two objectives, the enlargement of the substance of data and the improvement of the form in which they are or will be accessible. Since we want our data to be not just big, but also diversified and roughly or anyhow or appro approximately representative for the totality of the Egyptian language, our selection of new texts to be filled in the database aims at strengthening parts is also underrepresented in the data. By now, the TLA contains 1. Million, million tokens of Egyptian words. The range of hieroglyphic and hieratic texts included so far runs from 4th dynasty autobiographies up to late Egyptian religious and funerary compositions attested in manuscripts from the Ptolemaic and Roman periods. The digitalization of the corpus of late Egyptian texts is the domain of our cooperat cooperation partner, the project Ramses, run by Jean Vinant and Stéphane Polis at the University of Liège. A substantial part of demotic texts is already in the TLA data. The integration of a corpus of Coptic texts and one of pre-Old Kingdom Egyptian texts our future goals. The other core appliance, the WE TLA, the integrated root list of the entire, uh, entire Egyptian Coptic vocabulary, is still under preparation. Two of its components, a hieroglyphic plus hieratic lemma list and a demotic lemma list, are already implemented but not yet linked with each other. A third component, the Coptic lemma list, is underway. Its basic layer, uh, the Hittic list replicating Crumb's dictionary, is almost finished. Its fourth component will be an index of consonantal roots underlying the Egyptian root formation patterns. Finally, a Greek and an Arabic lemma list will be contributing the lone vocabulary that became part of the Egyptian lexicon in the fourth, in the first millennium CE. The clue of the VTLA will be the integration of all these components in one structure. Operations which would require consultation of 20 dictionaries by now will then be manageable in one stroke. Moreover, all the hundreds of thousands attestations of the full text corpus TLA are fully lemmatized and therefore automatically running in the background of the VTLA so that token frequency will be a systematically analyzable parameter. Both tools, the TLA and the VTLA, have their primary aim within the diachronic research agenda of the project structure and transformation. Both of them, however, will also be major contributions to of, of this project to a much broader agenda, the creation of a new di di digital dictionary of Egyptian, which has recently become an issue in international Egyptology on initiative of Jean Vinant of the Ramses project and his team. Sixth point, Greek loanword lexicography, the project database and dictionary of Greek loanwords in Coptic, DDGLC. The most recent attempt to break the old curse weighing upon Coptic loanword lexicography is the project database and dictionary of Greek loanwords in Coptic, DDGLC. 
and we are confident that the blessings of digital technology will help us doing the trick this time. The DDGLC is a long-term project of the German Research Council. It started in 2010 at the Institute of Egyptology Georg Steindorf at the University of Leipzig. Recently moved to the Egyptological Seminar of the Free University of Berlin and it will keep working here further nine years from now. The DDGLC project seeks to produce a systematic, comprehensive and detailed lexicographical compilation and description of Greek loanwords from the entire Coptic corpus in all its dialects and text genres. The core tool of the DDGLC project is a database structured through the relationship between multiple levels of data. The Greek lemma list of the DDGLC project, the highest structural level of the data bank, encompasses at this moment more than 5,000 Greek words of almost all parts of speech, including nouns, adjectives, adverbs, verbs, conjunctions, prepositions and particles from a wide range of semantic domains. This number of or whatever it will come to be in the end is derived from a compilation of available indices to published Coptic, Coptic texts and text corpora. It, it documents the entirety of Greek loan vocabulary in an undifferentiated super-Coptic of all eras, regions and text types. The attestation level is the basic level of the database and the main workplace of the daily lexicographical labels. It contains records of individual instances, tokens, of Greek-derived words what in traditional lexicography used to be lexicographical slips. Approximately 58,000 single loanword attestations in Coptic have been recorded so far, and the established lexicographical procedure allows us to increase our data by around 2,000 attestations a month. Each attestation is linked to manuscript and text metadata allowing to differentiate the borrowability of Greek words into Coptic, not just along linguistic features, but also according to social historical para parameters such as region, dating, content and genre of text. Each attestation is identified, of course, and accompanied by a quotation of its Coptic context and an English translation thereof. The individual, the individual spelling of each loanword attestation is recorded and a formal description of its syntactic properties as a part of Coptic speech is annotated by grammatical codes. In the case of nouns, for instance, these codes relate to nominal categories such as gender, number and determination. In the case of verbs, they systematically provide information on Coptic verbal syntax, argument structure, and valency patterns. The letter data can hopefully soon be exploited in a project named Transitivity and Valency in Language Contact, for which Ethan Crossman and I applied at the German Israeli Foundation. Each attestation is linked to a Greek lemma and to the Coptic lemma Coptic Lemma Interface. The Coptic Lemma Interface is the layer between the Lemma level, containing unspecified Greek input forms, and the attestation level with its individual descriptions of specific instances. It is the part of the database which increasingly gains similarity with the dictionary. The current types and traits of individual usages are distinguished at this level alongside parameters such as pragmatics, semantic nuances, 
syntactic properties and phraseology. A good deal of literary and non-literary dialectal and diachronic varieties of Coptic have already been incorporated in the DDGLC database. There are, however, plans to expand the DDGLC database in two directions. First, by the incorporation of Greek words in pre-Coptic Egyptian, notably in Demotic, and second, by the integration of Arabic loanwords. In the long term, the DDGLC project thus aims at working through the entirety of loanword data in the, in the Egyptian text corpus from the 4th century BCE through the 14th century CE. The future out outcome of the DDGLC project is meant to serve the requirements of several groups of scholars, such as Coptic and Greek philologists, Egyptian linguists, and general linguists. We want to provide Coptic philologists with detailed semantic and syntactic information on the Coptic usage of Greek words, historical linguists of Egyptian with evidence for the history of contact-induced change of the Egyptian lexicon, and general linguists with data for cross-linguistic investigation in loanword typology. By now, these data are not yet accessible online. However, a migration of the database and the data into a MySQL target system is underway and will allow us to offer an online user interface, possibly in the course of this year. What we all already do offer is a little byword of our a uh, proper project, what we call the Gertrud Bauer Zettelkasten Online. This compilation of uh, like 15,000 lexicographical slips uh, documenting Greek particles, prepositions, conjunctions, and adverbs in Coptic, which is uh, a, a, a nice and valuable lexicogra lexicographical instrument. One, uh, yeah, one get uh, uh, LMA list and uh, and uh, substructure into uh, so, uh, uh, subdivision into uh, semantic and syntactic uh, uh, subcategories as defined by Gertrude Bauer, and one ends up uh, at the original Zettel, the hand the handwritten uh, index card with a uh, with a transcription into computer uh, uh, um, funds. The notion of Zettelkasten brings me to my last point, my conclusion. On a shelf of my office at the Berlin Academy, there are seven Zettelkästen, boxes filled with lexicographical slips. Someone has meticulously recorded Coptic lemmata through several dialects and assigned hieroglyphic uh, antecedents to the Coptic forms. And according to somebody who labeled these boxes, I am afraid you don't recognize this. According to someone who labeled these boxes, the anonymous lexicographer was possibly, there is a question mark, Polotsky, who certainly had been working here in the early 30s before he left Germany. I am rather doubtful about this identification. I don't know. In any case, lexicography seems not to have been Polotsky's favorite field of study as compared to other domains of his wide-ranging linguistic interests, 
such as phonology, prosody, morphology, and syntax, and the functional interplay of several language levels in what he put with a Humboldtian term, the inner form of language. The same seems to hold true for diachronic variety as far as I am aware. Also, Palatsky's profound knowledge of the different phases of the Egyptian Coptic language occasionally surfaces throughout his work and most insightful remarks on the historical development of certain constructions. He was generally following the structuralist agenda of dealing with languages strictly in terms of synchrony. At least he did not so much deal with diachronic change as a topic in its own right, or perhaps I'm wrong about this. In any case, I am bold enough to hope that the topic of my paper may have pleased him in some way. At least my innocence was not bad enough to provoke his angry spirit to appear here in this room and to chastise me in the public as I had been dreading before. As I had no accomplishments to offer, I resorted to advertisement of projects and to prefiguring the prospective benefits. Whether all of this was actually worth presenting to this venerable academy in honor and in memory of Hans Jakob Polotsky is depending on our future success to materialize these benefits. And I can only ask you to wish us good luck with our demanding, but as I believe, most worthwhile endeavors. Both projects presented here, the TLA and VTLA, as well as the DDGRC, are responses to lasting desiderata in the lexicography of Egyptian Coptic. The peculiar disregard of the huge repertory of loanwords in the later phases of the Egyptian Coptic language and a strict separation of its diachronic layers in the wake of the Berlin School and the structuralist, structuralist methodologi methodological claim of synchrony. We seem now to be ready to go the way back on the next floor up to reintegrate the discarded loan vocabulary in the lexicon of Egyptian Coptic in its later and terminal phase, to re-establish the diachronic integrity of the whole Egyptian Coptic lexicon, and in result, to gain a fuller picture of, the, of one of the most continuously evidenced cases of diachronic retention and change in human language the case of Egyptian Coptic. Thank you for granting me the honor of your attention.